Howdy my totally as always tubular gamers, we're back with a you guessed it another ranking video. Thanks for coming back to the channel. If you're new here, maybe stick around for a while. I got a fun ranking video for you. Today we're going to be talking about Alone in the Dark. And no, we're not talking about my sex life, we're going to be ranking the Alone in the Dark games. For the unfamiliar, the original Alone in the Dark came out all the way back in 1992 and really is like the forefather of survival horror games. Yeah, there was Sweet Home, but Alone in the Dark really is the game that pushed the genre forward and it's thanks to Alone in the Dark that we have so many amazing series like Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Fatal Frame, etc. They all owe something to Alone in the Dark. But it's really easy to forget that this is actually an entire series of games. There's more than just this original game. There's actually several other Alone in the Dark games and today we're going to be looking at all of them. From those original games to the ones in the 2000s, all the way up until the modern reimagining, remake, whatever the hell you want to call this thing, the latest Alone in the Dark title, the series is finally back after a long hiatus. And I'm pumped because I actually love the Alone in the Dark series, I've been a big fan of this series through all of its peaks and valleys, and I'm just glad that it's back. And so you know how these videos go, and if you don't, maybe you should subscribe to find out how they go. We're going to be ranking these games worst to best, I'll be giving each one of these games a little review, I've played all of them quite a bit actually. And so there will be some comparing and contrasting. I'll be looking at a variety of aspects while talking about these games. Is the gameplay any good? Does it hold up? Is it still scary? Is the story awful? Or is it a hidden gem and something you should totally go play? That's what we're here to find out. I talked about these games a couple years ago and my opinion hasn't really changed all that much on them. So there might be a few familiar beats here. I really do love this series and I'm just happy to be talking about it again. I actually did a very long video reviewing every single one of these games in much more detail which I'll put a link to. And before we begin I do want to give a major shout out to THQ Nordic and Game Tomb for hooking me up with a review code. Seriously, thank you very much. This is like a dream come true to get the new Alone in the Dark sent to me. I really do appreciate it. Thank. But this intro has gone on long enough. Let's get right into it. Please like, share, comment, subscribe. We got the Patreon and the super thanks. Any support is truly greatly appreciated. And I do want to give a huge shout out to Ghost Zero. Thank you very much for the support. It really is appreciated. All right, let me know down below what your favorite Alone in the Dark game is, or if you've played any of these games. Let's just get right into it. What is the worst of these games? Without a shadow of doubt, the worst of the Alone in the Dark series is Alone in the Dark Illumination, which is thankfully not the latest Alone in the Dark game. I say thankfully because this game is awful. The game has basically nothing to do with the other Alone in the Dark games, or if it does, it's very small cameos or mentions. And the game is essentially a cooperative Left 4 Dead style shooter where you'll go through these levels just getting absolutely bombarded by monsters and having to complete some tasks and really just try to survive. So let me just take a stop right there and say that this is a cooperative focus game. The game is called Alone in the Dark, you know, alone. They really just missed the mark here, but that's not the only thing they missed. This really is one of the jankiest shooters I've ever played. The controls are just all around terrible. Nothing feels nice. Like the shooting is just incredibly buggy and it's not just the shooting. This is a very, very glitchy game where it feels like very little actually works. The pathfinding and AI are terrible. Again, the shooting isn't very good. Sound effects are just straight up missing like half the time. There's tons of graphical issues. The optimization is awful. And technically speaking, it's just a complete disaster. It really is a mess. Enemies don't spawn in, the objective doesn't work, or the game just crashes and glitches out completely to the point where it's almost unplayable. The game was dead on arrival and is genuinely one of the worst video games I've ever played. I'm real glad this isn't the last Alone in the Dark game anymore. We have something that's better than this. Do not ever think about this game again. And so our next game is the 2008 Alone in the Dark, the infamous reboot that was done by Atari. This game is pretty infamous as one of the worst reboots in video game history. And honestly, with good reason, the game is just not very good. And I've actually talked a lot about this game in the past. I have a lot of things to say about it, but I'll just hit some of the bullet points. The plot of this game is just completely all over the place. It tries to connect to the original Alone in the Dark, tries to do its own thing. Your main character has amnesia and doesn't remember anything. All hell is breaking loose. There's earthquakes and fissures all over these like hell demons. Really, it seems like the end of the world, I guess. And Edward Carnby, the main character, is just like, what the fuck is even going on? The story is needlessly convoluted, it has some really stupid plot twists, it doesn't really go anywhere, and the ending is just laughably bad. I'm the light bringer! I'm the fucking universe! Fucking universe! Fucking universe! <laughs> It's probably one of the stupidest plots in any video game I've ever seen. 
but it is absolutely hilarious. It is definitely so bad that it's good. And I frequently found myself laughing at the characters and their delivery and really just what was going on. Give me my stone. I don't have your stone. And fuck you anyway. The gameplay is really the developers throwing everything at the wall and hoping something sticks. Like, it is just a complete clusterfuck with a terrible beat-em-up system, worse shooting, bad survival elements, a blinking mechanic, needless crafting, bad driving, and the list goes on and on. None of it's done well, the gameplay feels very unfocused, unrefined, and all around just isn't very fun to play. The game sure as hell not scary. I mean, it is funny, and it does have some interesting mechanics thrown in there, like the fire mechanic. However, just like the rest of the gameplay, it's not really all that defined, and it's not really all that well thought out. They just basically were like, hey, what's popular in the mid-2000s? Oh, this is? Put it in. Bad platforming, poor movement, weirdly implemented light system. The list really goes on and on. I could be here for another hour talking about this game's issues. Now, it is worth bringing up that there was a re-release of this game, subtitled Inferno, that is a little bit better than this game, but it really still is not worth playing. Do not play the Alone in the Dark reboot. While it might have some interesting ideas, it just does not come together for an enjoyable experience. So our next game is Alone in the Dark 2 One-Eyed Jack's Revenge, which released on the PC, PS1, and the Sega Saturn. The game takes place right after the first Alone in the Dark and still stars Edward Carnby. This time it sees him going to a estate looking for this girl that's gone missing known as Grace. The plot of the game is surprisingly well done and it actually is really fleshed out with some strong villains and some interesting characters. The game has some really nice backgrounds, a lot of the still images look pretty alright and have a fair amount of detail in them. And while we're talking positively about the game, the music in this game is awesome. It's really well done, there's a lot of catchy tunes, a lot of it sets the mood. I really like the music of this game. And that's about all I can say positively about Alone in the Dark 2. See, when it comes to the gameplay, the developers just did not understand what made the original Alone in the Dark so special, like, at all, because they dropped a lot of the great aspects of it, and what we have here is a very mediocre to bad game. The game dropped all semblance of horror and a lot of the survival elements, and tries to favor a more action-style approach, which does not work at all in this game's favor. In the original Alone in the Dark, the weakest aspect was easily the combat, so what did the developers focus on for the sequel? Combat. You engage in combat more than you do anything else in this game. Forget solving those interesting puzzles or exploring around the world. No, you're getting involved in combat in this game, and it really is bad. Tank controls have their place in video games. Obviously they do, but this is not the right setting for them. It controls terribly, it's very clunky, aiming is just terrible, and you engage in way too many enemies at once. Edward is very cumbersome and will frequently get locked into stun animations that will just lead you to dying really quickly. Like, the amount of times you get stun locked in this game has got to be like some record. The game is overly punishing, it is brutally difficult at the start and leaves a terrible first impression, and the combat just doesn't flow well at all. Besides the bad combat, there are some very poorly implemented stealth segments where you play as Grace, the little girl. These less said about them the better. The puzzles are nowhere near as good as the original game. A lot of them are just way too obtuse 90s puzzles for anyone really. Like if you don't have a walkthrough, good luck. But I don't recommend a walkthrough for this game because I don't recommend this game period. It totally falls flat as a sequel, doesn't understand really anything about the original Alone in the Dark, and just made me scratch my head like what were they thinking with this game? And so here we have Alone in the Dark 3. This game takes place after Alone in the Dark 2 and still stars Edward Carnby. He's still a private investigator, and he's tasked with going to a movie set after the entire crew disappears. The movie that they were filming was a Wild West themed movie, so they created a Wild West town and everything. However, when you get there, it's all abandoned and, well, there's some spooky shit going on here. While I think the initial setup and premise is actually better than the second game and more aligned with what made the OG Alone in the Dark good, the plot unfortunately doesn't go anywhere interesting and it really is kind of boring and just fizzles out by the end of it. The gameplay is much more like a survival horror game with a much less emphasis on combat. The combat is still there, it's still pretty bad, but it's not as ridiculous as the second game and it's not a majority of the game. A majority of the game is exploring the environment, solving puzzles, and figuring out just what the hell's going on. 
the atmosphere was actually really well done and I really liked what they did when it came to exploring the environment. I thought the puzzles were decent enough. They weren't great or anything, but they were they were fine. And the combat luckily doesn't rear its head too much. I mean, some of it, most of it really is like hand to hand, which was always better than the gun crap. Something that does rear its ugly head though is platforming. Yes, this game actually is platforming in it and it is bad. It is really bad. While most of the puzzles are fine enough, there was like one or two in here where I'm just like, how the hell was anybody supposed to know that? Like where you put the bullet in the keyhole and then the hammer to the bullet, like no, nobody would have known to do that normally. And there's a few times where it's just not clear what's background and what's an item you can actually pick up. Like there's just not a very good distinction. The graphics were very by the numbers for the time. Like, I mean, look at it. It's an old game. No shit. And the music is pretty underrated. Alone in the Dark 3 gets talked about less than 1 and 2, and I don't really know why that is. I think it's better than 2, but I still wouldn't say it's all that good. I mean, it's okay, but it's it's not really better than okay. I mean, I would have a hard time recommending this game. This is one where I can say, unless you're like a survival horror or horror game enthusiast, you're really not going to get anything from this game. Everyone else can probably just skip it. And so here we have the original Alone in the Dark, the one that started it all coming out all the way back in 1992. This game really was genre defining and it's clear that the developers had lightning in a bottle and lightning did not strike twice with them for the later games. But this original game, it's absolutely a classic. The original Alone in the Dark has aged. I mean, obviously it's aged. Look at it. The graphics are primitive. Some of the interfaces are very clunky. To do stuff, you have to go into a menu. Of course it's aged. But beyond that, I still think that the game is absolutely great. The core gameplay, the gameplay loop has absolutely aged marvelously because it's still the same gameplay loop that is used even nowadays in horror games where you're investigating areas, collecting items, managing resources, and occasionally getting into combat. The atmosphere that this original game has is actually very well done. The primitive graphics, I think, work to the game's favor as you have to actually use your imagination for some of this, as corny as that sounds, and the imagination is way scarier than what a game from the 90s could do. The game's story and premise is quite simple, and it works to the game's favor, where it's just about the player going into this mansion and figuring out what the hell's going on, and some spooky, deep shit goes down, and I'm gonna just leave it at that because it's actually really well done. The game has a great sense of exploration. I really liked all the environments. They're all really well made. The puzzles are maybe the best in like the whole series, really. They're actually quite good. They're all really well thought out and you don't even need like a walkthrough for any of them. They're all decently basic. The atmosphere is very foreboding. You can still feel the game's atmosphere despite the age graphics. The music is very well done. It's very tense. The game feels tense and it really just shows that they just totally struck a chord with this game. However, I will say not all of the game is excellent towards the end of the game, really the last fourth of the game. It's not particularly great. There's some bad platforming, there's an annoying maze, and it really just doesn't come together like the first three quarters did. Also, it feels like it just kind of abandons what made the first part of the game good. But again, it's not like a ton of the game. It is only the last portion of the game. It's not a deal breaker or anything like that. And I still very much would recommend the original Alone in the Dark. If you've ever played any any survival horror game, you'll be able to pick this game up and understand it. Yeah, it has aged and it will take a little bit of time to get used to the game's interface and controls, but it very much is manageable. Except that combat, man. The combat, even for the time, it just wasn't very good. At the end of the day, the original Alone in the Dark is still absolutely worth playing. It is a classic for a reason. And I really think anyone who's a fan of the genre should check out this game, see where everything got started. And so here we have the latest Alone in the Dark, simply titled Alone in the Dark, releasing here in 2024. Again, major shout out to Game Tomb and THQ Nordic for hooking me up with a key. I really was excited for this game. One of my most hyped games of the year. And so the question obviously becomes, how is it? Is it even any good? Yeah, I actually do enjoy this game. While it isn't one of the genre's very best and it's not as, you know, big budget and fancy as, say, the Resident Evil remakes, I still rather enjoyed this new Alone in the Dark and it's easily the best Alone in the Dark in the last 20, almost 25 years ago and it's absolutely a step in the right direction for the franchise if they will choose to continue it after this game, which I'm hopeful for. So this game is a reimagining of that original game for the modern era. It's not a remake, it's not a one-for-one -one recreation. It does follow 
follow a few similar beats, but for the most part, it really is its own beast. The game takes place in the 1930s, and it sees our two main characters, Edward Carnby and Emily Hartwood, making their way through this mysterious mansion to find Emily's uncle and just figure out what the hell is going on. When it comes to the story, I actually quite like it. I think it's intriguing. It's got an interesting premise. The way things continue, it just gets better and better. And the mystery is actually really good. And by the end of it, I was just like, holy shit, what is even going on? Sure, it's not the most high stakes world altering events. And it is kind of low key compared to some other survival horror games. But I still enjoyed it. I actually do like the characters in this game. There are a bunch of, uh, we'll just say some interesting folk at this mansion and you have some really intriguing conversations with them. I think the two main characters are decent enough as well and the world building is actually pretty strong. I feel like the developers were able to create a world that I found myself easily engrossed in and I really did want to see what was going to happen. This game has like this really unsettling vibe, especially when you're talking to the other characters. Like they know something's up that you don't know and they don't tell you and you just got to figure it out for yourself. In fact, when it comes to the unsettling vibe, I think the atmosphere is actually pretty good in this game. Like, I was a little surprised with how into the atmosphere I got with this game. I think it's one of the game's best aspects, along with the story in general. When it comes to the gameplay, this game, it's not too far off from the Resident Evil remakes, to be a bit reductive. I mean, Alone in the Dark was first, but come on, if you play this game for even like 10-15 minutes, you'll see immediately, based on the menus, the structure, the format, etc., that yeah, they took a few notes from Resident Evil. So I guess they're just taken from each other. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. What matters is, is the gameplay any good? Yes, I think the gameplay is good. Good. It is your pretty standard third person over the shoulder survival horror game where you will be moving through this mansion trying to uncover the mystery. Along the way, there are plenty of things that will try to stop you, whether it's some enemies that you will have to get in combat with, the many puzzles, or you're just trying to figure out really where to go next. You know what I'm talking about, where they give you an item and they tell you, this goes somewhere, figure out where it goes, and so you go wander around the mansion. There's really two parts to the gameplay. When you're in the mansion itself, you won't really be attacked by enemies. You'll be mostly solving puzzles and figuring out where to go. The other part is when you get teleported to another dimension another world another area I'll just say you get teleported somewhere that isn't the mansion and here it's mostly combat there's a little bit of puzzle solving but a majority of this is combat and so let's talk about the combat it's pretty standard it really doesn't do anything all that special or anything you haven't seen from any video game where you hold a gun and shoot at something there's three different weapons in the game a pistol shotgun Tommy gun and they all feel decent enough they've all got a little bit of weight to them the guns don't feel particularly satisfying but it doesn't feel bad either it's just all right and you'll be a attacked by plenty of different monsters. However, it doesn't really matter what monster is attacking you, you kind of just take them all down the same. You just shoot at them a bunch until they go down. And you know, the combat, it's fine enough. There is melee combat. You know, you can pick up a melee weapon and swing it around until it breaks. And the melee combat, yeah, it looks a bit rough. It doesn't feel terrible, but it just feels a little janky. The combat in general can feel janky at times when you get hit by enemies or you're trying to dodge out of the way. Like with this dodge move, it can feel janky at times. It doesn't feel anywhere near as smooth as the Resident Evil games, but it's not unplayable. It's not awful it's not buggy as shit it just isn't crazy polish like certain other triple a games but this is not a triple a game this is very much a double a game and so i'm gonna let it pass i think the combat in this game it's good enough it's not gonna win any awards it's not gonna wow you but it gets the job done and it's certainly not bad when it comes to the puzzles i think they're actually pretty decent in this game and i had some fun with them it is some of the best puzzles this series has ever seen and I wouldn't say there's a bad one here. There's a couple that are more annoying than others, but for the most part, I thought they were decent enough and I actually did enjoy them. And then when it comes to this game's sense of exploration or discovery, I also think it's decent. I had fun exploring around the mansion and some of these other areas you go to. It's not amazing. It's not crazy good. Where you're like, oh my God, I have to check every single nook and cranny because there's just so much hidden shit and I'm just having such a great time. No, it's not that good, but it's decent enough. And then it might be easy to forget, but this is a horror game at the end of the day. It is supposed to scare you. Is this game scary? Yes, it actually did get me a few times. It is rather unsettling at times. And there were a few parts that genuinely really did get me by surprise. In fact, I will say there's one that really got me. They pulled almost like a Batman Arkham out here and I went, holy shit, that, that actually got me. And so the horror, yeah, I think it's decent. I also think the pacing and the progression is pretty well done in this game as well. It continues things at a good pace. It doesn't ever drag its feet. And I was continuously intrigued throughout the entire game. And I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but you can play through this game as two different characters, Edward and Emily. And if you want the full story, you will need to play through as both. But I will say a majority of their playthrough, like 90% of their playthrough, is basically exactly the same. There's one segment that's exclusive for each character, and some of the cutscenes are a little different, but that's really it. 
This is not like Resident Evil 2 where it's very different campaigns from each other. No, it very much is almost the same campaign again, complete with the same puzzles and solutions. With that in mind, it took me around six or seven hours to beat it the first time. Second time around, it was like two or three hours. And so you're looking at maybe nine to 12 hours of gameplay. If you want to like 100% it, there are some collectibles you can find in some secret little bonus endings. But yeah, the game, it doesn't have, you know, an absolute ass ton of content like some other survival horror games, but I still think it's decently replayable it's got a good length and it ends before it wears out its welcome or gets stale or repetitive or anything like that. Something else I want to bring up is the presentation. I think it is pretty good, especially considering it is a double A game. I think the two main characters, since, you know, they were scanned in, they actually look very good. None of the other character models look anywhere near as good, but two main characters, they're very well done. I think the environment looks nice and I never had any issues with the frame rate. I played the game on PS5 and I thought it ran fine the entire time. I did have several glitches show up where textures were like popping in super late or I got stuck on the environment environment or things were just clipping in and out and not properly loading, but it wasn't anything game breaking. It didn't really break my immersion all that much, and I was able to move past it with relative ease. At the end of the day, is Alone in the Dark worth playing? If you like survival horror games, I absolutely think this game is worth playing. Sure, it is a little rough around the edges at times, and it doesn't really do anything to push the genre forward, but what you have is still a very solid experience that I believe fans of the genre will eat up. If you like the modern Resident Evil games, I think you're gonna like this game too. It's not crazy, Polish, the combat is just all right, and I wouldn't say it all comes together as well as some other survival horror games, but genuinely, yes, I did enjoy my time with it and have no problem recommending it. If you think that the game is way too pricey at its current price point, give it six months. This game will be $20 before you know it, and then I absolutely recommend it. It's a fun weekend, and you might even get some good scares. I'm just happy that the series is good again. That's good to hear. But I don't think it's the very best of the Alone in the Dark games. I believe the best, and it might just always be the best at this point, is Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare, which came out in 2001. And I genuinely believe that this is one of, if not like, the most underrated survival horror game of them all. This is actually a very good game. The developers really looked at the original Alone in the Dark and what made it scary in the first place and tried to recreate it for a new modern audience. Then again, this was also 2000, but at the time, modern audience. And this game was very much up against the big boys of Resident Evil, Silent Hill, and soon enough Fatal Frame, and yeah, it kind of got slept on, and over the years, a lot of people have forgot that this game even exists. But here I am to praise it one more time. So the game sees our man Edward Carnby teaming up with newcomer Elaine heading to this island known as Shadow Island, no connection to Metal Gear Solid to go investigate what the hell's going on with it. And that's all I'm gonna say because I really don't want to ruin this game's story or mystery. The story is actually pretty good in this game. The two main characters split up pretty much immediately and have very different stories from each other. Sure, they do meet up from time to time, but if you want the full experience, you want to understand the story, you will need to play through the game twice. It actually does a better job at this than even the modern game. Game, so yeah, I guess it is pretty good. Like both characters have a bunch of specific situations that only that character gets into much more than the modern game and I thought it was cool for the time, it's cool now. Now when it comes to the core gameplay, yeah, it is kind of your standard run-of-the-mill survival horror game, but I mean, like I've said before, Alone in the Dark was really the series that started it all, so I guess it's, you know, going back to its roots, it's doing what it started, but yes, it very much was in Resident Evil's shadow when it came out. If you couldn't tell by now, the game has the fixed camera angles, it still has tank controls, which are not annoying, the tank controls are actually good in this game, and a bunch of survival elements. You'll be exploring around this mansion, really this island, just trying to figure out what the hell's going on you'll get into combat with a bunch of different creatures you'll solve some puzzles get some items and have to figure out where those items go something that i thought the first time i played this game and even nowadays is that i think this game has actually aged incredibly well it's impressive how well the game is actually aged like I said, the controls are pretty decent in this game. They're intuitive. It's usually pretty clear where you need to go next. I think the exploration is actually well done and the combat, it's more than serviceable. It's actually decent. But you also got to remember they were coming from Alone in the Dark 2 and 3, which had pretty terrible combat. This is a huge leap forward. And I would say that, yeah, it's more than serviceable enough. When it comes to the puzzles, these are some of the best of the series. This probably is the best puzzles of the series. This or the new one. There are actually some really creative puzzles and you will have to do some thinking when it comes to these puzzles as well. They're not super obtuse and requiring a walkthrough. I mean, they might require a walkthrough if you don't have the patience, but for the most part, I think you'll be able to figure them out with even a little bit of thinking power. On top of this, I think the game has a great sense of exploration. You'll really want to explore every nook and cranny of this island, and it's very much worth it. I had a good time exploring the island as both characters, and then the atmosphere? Oh, this is like the best atmosphere of the whole series. 
Like this game just has some of the best vibes I've ever gotten from a horror game. I really was picking up what this game was putting down. It's tense, there's dread, it just evokes a certain fear into you like it got to me. I mean, maybe I'm just a little baby, but I really did enjoy this game's atmosphere. I think it is very well done and it's aged incredibly well. And one reason I think the atmosphere is as good as it is, is the presentation. The presentation actually very much still holds up. I think it was a good looking game for the time and it's decent looking now. The environments look nice. They aren't just crazy blurry. They actually have a decent amount of detail and I think that there's some nice looking backgrounds. The character models are nice. The voice acting is decent enough. Yeah, the presentation, it's good. I think everything comes together to create a pretty great horror experience. This is an underrated gem. It genuinely is a gem that not enough people talk about did it reinvent the formula did it reinvent the wheel absolutely not but what i think it does well it does really well it creates a tense atmosphere it has decent enough gameplay it's still very accessible nowadays and it really feels like they took the gameplay and world of that original game and brought it to a more modern era it's way easier to come back to this game than those original games i'll say that and I feel like they actually really understood what this series was about, about putting you alone in the dark. Like even the modern game, it's pretty bright. This one, no, you're in some dark ass environments with a little flashlight getting hunted by monsters and it's scary. This is a scary game. It's maybe the scariest of the entire franchise. I thought it was scary then. I think it's scary now. The atmosphere really adds to it and it just all comes together in a way that really works. Again, it doesn't do anything you haven't really seen from the genre before. A especially if you've played a bunch of games like this, but it just hits different with this game is what I'm trying to say. If you've played it, you know what I'm talking about. I've had plenty of people tell me that they love the new nightmare, that it just hit different and it was a scary ass game. And I totally agree. All these years later, I think the new nightmare is awesome and totally worth playing. It isn't the most readily available, sadly, but if you download it or get your hands on it, I really think it is worth playing, especially if you like survival horror games. This really is a must for survival horror fans. The game was also released on the Game Boy Color, which is strange enough. I don't have any experience with this game, but it is worth bringing up. I think it's even on the Switch Online, which is hella random. But I'm getting off topic here. The New Nightmare, it's very good. It is worth playing. It's one of my favorite survival horror games of all time, straight up. When it comes to Alone in the Dark in general, I think it's a pretty decent series. I've heard some people say that there's not a single good game in the series that is and always will be crap. And that just simply isn't true. Sure, some of the games are bad. Some of them are really bad, actually. But there's a few hidden gems in there. I think the original's good. I think the new one's good. And I think the New Nightmare's great. And if you really do think this series sucks, well, all I can say is it's clear you didn't play The New Nightmare because I just can't imagine someone thinking that this is bad or awful or anything like that. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Let's end it here. Hope you all enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed me talking about Alone in the Dark. Sure, there was a little recycling here, but I don't really have a lot of new things to say about this series. I talked about this series plenty of times and to a much greater extent, I'll put the video in the description. It's like a two and a half hour video, but man, I go really in depth with these games. I'm gonna hype that up forever. If you made it to this part of the video, comment alone because that's not where you're gonna be. You're not gonna be alone. Somebody loves you out there. I assure you, somebody cares about you. If you don't know who they are, I'll care about you. It's all good. I don't know what I'm talking about. Hope you have a good one. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye now.